There's news in the NFL today, and it's time to break it down in the only way we know how. Hot Rock Style, with our spin on football headlines with a mix of frozen tundras, neck rolls, and grass-stained jerseys. Hello and welcome to Hot Routes. I am your host, as always, Paul Hodewanek, and with me, Purple Insider's own Sam Ekstrom. Sam, we were just talking, doesn't quite feel like the offseason for us yet because we've just hired a GM, still a head coaching search in the mix. It's busy, busy times to be a Vikings reporter, to be a Vikings fan, to be in that building. Yeah, I feel like every day, regardless of time of day, just sort of indiscriminately, there are news breaks. Like 9.30 last night, we found out Jim Harbaugh is flying in on a Wednesday for an interview. D'Amico Ryans drops out. Um, I'm doing radio hits on uh, on CCO with Henry Lake at like 10.30 p.m. to talk about it. So, I, you know, it, it really is still the grind of the season. And I don't know if it'll really ever ever settle down because, hey, free agency is uh, on the horizon as well. Free agency, then uh, there's going to be a Kirk decision in there. There's going to be draft yeah. stuff. There's tons and stuff, tons of tons of stuff to do. Luckily for you, big golfer, we can't quite golf yet. So hopefully it slows down right as we can hit hit the hit the fairways and and get out and do some golfing. But we have some more important stuff to tackle first. And that is a head coaching search. And so a lot of our questions today are going to be centered around that. And the first two are going to be centered around Jim Harbaugh, because that is the talk right now. He's coming in for the second interview. He appears to be that last second interview. Who knows if that gives him the inside track, if he's the last guy that gets an interview. But it just seems ever since his name was thrown out, the steam, it just keeps getting more and more prevalent. And so we may see a Jim Harbaugh hire by the Vikings in the next couple of days. We're recording Tuesday morning. So if anything happens, don't blame us. We're, this is Tuesday morning. Nothing has happened as of yet. But I want to know because the average NFL head coaching tenure is only 3.2 years, which I thought was pretty interesting. Maybe that just after you had Zimmer for so long, you get a little spoiled with the fact that teams are really turning over coaches rather quickly and it's accelerating one year, two year. They're just bouncing guys if they don't feel like they're right. So if Jim Harbaugh is the hire, do you think it's more or less likely after four seasons, so just over that three mark, that they would be looking for a new head coach? What what can you what do you kind of glean of the Harbaugh situation? Do you feel like it's more boom or bust? Like, do you think it's more or less likely after four years the Vikings are looking for someone new? Yeah, it's a great over under. Um, that's a crazy stat, by the way. I I get the sense that um, Jim Harbaugh is going to get a massive contract and I'm guessing the terms will probably leak. It'll probably be one of those eight year, $80 million deals. He's going to make a huge annual salary and the Wilfs are probably going to be on the hook for that. And I, I would worry about if they cut ties too early, you know, would the Wilfs be stuck paying that? Would that deter them from making a move too fast? Knowing how the Wilfs operate, they're not really knee-jerk owners. I don't think they would, you know, cut ties prematurely. I think the the worry would be that Jim Harbaugh sort of forces their hand and that they have the same issues that, you know, arose in San Francisco with Harbaugh and Trent Baalke, that he's surly, that he's difficult to work with, that he doesn't um, align with Quasi Adolfo Mensa from a cultural standpoint. And sort of what we've seen happen in other places. Now, I know that Harbaugh wins everywhere he goes. And if he wins early in his tenure here, that almost ensures, you know, getting past the three and a half year mark. But are they going to take shortcuts that sort of harm them long term? Are they going to try to to figure it out in year one uh, with him and try to win right away? I think that's a pretty big ask. So I'll go over the three and a half. But I'm afraid that it might come at the expense of the long-term health of the team if they try too hard to to be competitive right away. Yeah, to me, he feels like more of a lock to make it over that three years. But if we were setting this at like six, that's when I would have serious questions of if he's there at that point, just at the rate that he's burned out with other teams and kind of the propensity that he has. But I, I think you're right. The contract would kind of inhibit it at least for a few years. And because of his acumen, you'd think, He's going to get at least a winning season or two um, and probably a run in the playoffs one of those years just based on his track record and how good he's been. So 
I don't know if Harbaugh seems like the guy that you're going to have for eight, 10 years based on what he's done, but to clear that average mark, I think he has the cachet. I think he has that built up and I, I, I think it would be hard to move on from him that quickly. It would be probably easier to move on from a first year head coach that struggles in two years. They don't have a clear sense of the quarterback position and Quasey is looking at this and says, well, for my own job, we probably have to have a new direction. Uh, that doesn't seem like it would be the case, at least with Harbaugh in the immediate future. But I think if you're ranking guys who could be here a really, really long time, he's probably lower down on that list just because of how quickly he's kind of flamed out in other places with his mentality. And maybe that's changed. Who knows? But I also think he would clear that that average mark. Uh, but it's a really interesting question because if he's the higher, it's it doesn't seem like it's going to be about what's necessarily on the field. It's going to be how he interacts with the coaching staff, interacts with the front office, interacts with the players. Yeah, and I think we have to leave open the possibility, too, that he's learned lessons along the way. People can change. Um, Josh McDaniels, you know, did a big press conference in Las Vegas talking about how his Denver experience was a, a vitally important experience for his coaching development. And maybe the same can be said for Harbaugh. I think the, the difficult part with Harbaugh is he's not a great ambassador in front of the cameras. He he seems a bit humorless at times, um, a little bit intense, you know, kind of kind of just an, an unusual individual that sometimes I think can be tough. He doesn't really um, spread the message maybe as effectively as, as people would want. So it's more about what's happening behind the scenes. All right. Well, one more Harbaugh question. I want to know, he's been at three stops now, Stanford, Michigan, and San Francisco, of course, in the last decade or so. And I want to rank those, how he's done as a coach in those spots, uh, because he's had success at each of them, but I think differing expectations in a lot of them. So I want to know from you how you would rank his three previous head coaching experiences or his last three. Yeah, I, I think that San Francisco is number one with a bullet. I don't think it's particularly close. He goes in and he makes three bids at a Super Bowl in his first three years, reaches one, comes up just short of reaching, you know, two others, but deep playoff runs three years in a row, that's hard to do in the NFL. So I, I think that the San Francisco stint is easily number one. Um, by winning percentage, you would think Michigan would be number two, but I'm actually going to go with Stanford. That's just a harder place to win. Denny Green had trouble winning at Stanford. Bill Walsh had trouble winning at Stanford. Jack Elway, you know, like they've had a lot of great coaches and it's just, it's not necessarily the Pac-12 or at the time Pac-10 power that's going to automatically win. And, and Jim Harbaugh sort of turned them around, put them on the map and paved the way for a decade of success with David Shaw. Um, that's what earned him the San Francisco look is because he was so effective late in that that stint with Stanford. And I think that um, that's more impressive than winning at Michigan, where you should win. You're a name brand. And yes, he's had average to good results there. Not always good. Um, and if anything, it's been disappointing. I know they got to the to the playoff this year. That was a big step for them. And they got blown out by the eventual champions. Um, but it, it took five years or six years, I should say, to even get to that point. So I think Stanford is actually, um, you know, if you're judging on a curve, that's actually more impressive to me. Yeah, I had the same rankings. Uh, I really wanted to have an argument for that Stanford number one over San Francisco. I think it's hard to obviously argue with the, the postseason resume that he has with San Francisco. But I will say, I know you and Matt have talked about it um, in the couple podcasts that you've done about Harbaugh since this news broke. I mean, they had a lot of good draft picks right before he got there and that helped him supplement that roster. And then when he leaves, he kind of left it in shambles. I mean, you go Jim Tom Sula, then you go Chip Kelly. Like it wasn't a great roster at that point. And it, it, it kind of left them in a bad spot where, like you said, the longevity that he was able to provide at Stanford to continue them to be a powerhouse for a really long time. They've fallen off a little bit now, but they were kind of the cream of the crop there for a while with Harbaugh, and then with Shaw getting some big NFL guys. And to me, that was just a really, really impressive way that he built it up. And part of the way, at least in college, that you show you build something is if it can sustain after you're gone uh, with with a coach that you liked in Shaw and that kind of 
went right in and uh, continued the success. And you didn't have the, the turmoil of him leaving like you did with San Francisco and kind of the, the burnout that he had. So strictly on the field, I'd probably say San Francisco's number one, but just what he did turning around a situation, I think is, I mean, Stanford, I think that deserves at least a discussion for number one, but yeah, largely, I think this last year has clouded a, a really mediocre run that he's had at Michigan. Like Michigan is expected to do what it just did. Uh, and it was the first time it had done it. I think last year they were even thinking about getting rid of Harbaugh because he just couldn't beat Ohio state. Like, that's probably not the spot you want to be in. So yes, he rebounded and that deserves a lot of credit, but Michigan, I mean, by far to me, seems like the the third choice on, on that ranking. Yeah. We can't overlook either the, the story from Stanford where he like smeared a player's blood on his face to motivate them. Um, those are the kind of tactics that, that are going to turn a program around. So props to Harbaugh for, for figuring out what resonated with, uh, with college students back in 2007. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know how that would go now, but uh, let's <laughs> move on to our third hot route. Uh, we hear a lot about the different coaching trees. There's guys that are coming in in this cycle that are have been part of um, distinguished coaching trees. And so I want to rank them because we talk about, oh, is Belichick's not that good? Where does Andy Reid stack up? Where is McVay's growing young nucleus of head coaches that have kind of come from under him? So I want to know who is the the top coaching tree modern i can, you can't say bill parcells or something like that I'm not yeah i i think it's andy reed and and he's got the benefits certainly of of longevity between the eagles the chiefs i mean he has done this for a couple decades now so the the net was cast wide but you look at the results um john harbaugh doug peterson a couple super bowl winners sean mcdermott might get there Brad Childress, I mean, had a pretty good run with the Vikings. I'm not saying that he's like cream of the crop, but uh, Ron Rivera, Leslie Frazier, you know, Todd Bowles, some of the the secondary guys there. But the it's pretty top heavy with Andy Reid. Now, you know, from a an efficiency standpoint, in a very short amount of time, Sean McVay has generated some some pretty nice coaches. Um, Zach Taylor is in a Super Bowl. Matt Lafleur has been on the doorstep a handful of times. Brandon Staley, I think, is up and coming, you know, forward thinking. I, I really like what he brought to the Chargers. Um, so that right there is a nice start in about half a decade for Sean McVay. Bel Belichick is, I mean, let's talk about the worst coaching trees for, for a coach that's been around as long as he has. What, what has he really produced? I mean, even the guys that have had a modicum of success, in like Brian Flores and Bill O'Brien flame out massively in these locations, get fired unexpectedly. And it seems like kind of guy for guy, the personalities are just bad. They, they learn the X's and O's and they don't seem to take away a real, you know, education in bedside manner or relating to players, whether it's Patricia, whether it's McDaniels, um, whether it's Joe judge, um, none of these guys are really translating at all. So I, I'm not sure what, what Belichick is doing in New England that doesn't trick, you know, doesn't work um, for for coaching his coaches, but it doesn't seem to to really translate very well. Yeah, I, I don't know, and and it's been talked about a lot, but they tr traditionally those guys try to bring in that Belichick style, and it just continually does not work over and over and over again. Yeah, I think it's probably reading Vikings fans may be a little sour on it just because of their end experience with Childress, their end experience with Leslie Frazier, and then seeing. Matt Nagy flame out in the division. Like those, those three, not great, but Nagy's first season, they go 12 and four. And then you name all those other guys. I mean, Doug Peterson, even though he gets fired, he wins a Super Bowl. And you have Ron Rivera. So I think the longevity might win out there. But McVay, man, he's he's on his way. And I, it's been a joke. It was a joke for a really long time. Like if you had a cup of coffee with McVay, you were getting hired. But it, it's actually kind of worked out. It was used as a joke, but Zach Taylor, for all his perceived flaws, they're in the Super Bowl right now. That is a thing that Mike Zimmer can't say. A lot of coaches can't say. And then Brandon Staley seems like he's doing really, really good things with the Chargers. And so if Kevin O'Connell gets a, a head coaching job, that'll be interesting to see. If Raheem Morris gets a head coaching job, that'll be interesting mm -hmm. to see. Seems like he's got another two candidates that continue to churn out, that could continue to do really well. And he could just kind of continue to be a coaching factory. And I think 
it probably doesn't get talked about enough about McVay in that he continually loses coordinators like at one every year and they continue to be good and they continue to find good coaches to come through the ranks. And I think if you're projecting as a Vikings head coach, you want that. You want that pipeline of guys of, well, we lost Kevin Stefanski. Now we just have this next guy that's going to come in and be really, really good. Like Clint Kubiak isn't getting any uh, head coaching uh, interviews. I can't imagine he will uh, in the future or even get many OC jobs. So like that is just really aspirational stuff by McVay. So I um, I want to put him number one just of how efficient he's been in, in his short time. Almost as if you can continue your offensive success when your head coach is calling the plays. It's funny how that works. I, I don't know if there's a local team that would want to adopt that philosophy. But Interesting. I Interesting. I don't know. Just leave that out there. All right. I want, I sent you this. I said, let's rank the top three head coaching hiring so far, not realizing there's only been four and there have just been, there's been so much smoke around every job. It felt like the Jags were about to hire a head coach for the last two weeks. It felt same way for the Texans, but yet we're still only sitting with head with four head coaching openings that have been filled. So I want to rank them so far uh, where you think the best hires have come, where you think the worst hires have come. So let's let's rank the four head coaches that have been hired so far. That is Nathaniel Hackett, Brian Dayball, Josh McDaniels, and Matt Eberflus. Yeah, I I think that uh, that Matt that Matt I almost said Matthew Hackett, which if if old Vikings fans know, Matthew Hatchett was a really fun like fourth wide receiver during the Moss Carter Reed years. Nathaniel Hackett, um, I think's number one. Uh, I think going to, to Denver, you know, it's it's the right kind of guy to to at least give you a shot. I think with whoever your quarterback's going to be in a really tough division, um, you know, I think that Dable is probably number two. I think that the the Giants need a shot in the arm, and if they're going to build around Daniel Jones, they need to do something different. And that may, might be incorporating a little bit of the spread concepts that the Dable implemented in Buffalo. Dable obviously had a ton of success there. Um, deserves props for turning Josh Allen around. McDaniels, uh, number three, you know, again, his previous stint in Denver was not good. And he turned his back on the Colts. And I think he needs to prove himself before I'm going to I'm gonna bill that as an excellent hire. Uh, and then Aberflus, you know, I'm just, I'm a little bit nervous about pairing um, a non quarterbacks guy with a young quarterback in Justin Fields. And again, you know, we saw with the bears that I, I, I think they probably need, you know, like offensive support on that team. It's not really a thriving offense at all. And there's not a lot of weapons on that side of the ball. So I, I would want someone to cultivate that. And I don't know a ton about Aberflus, um, but, but clearly the bears are going for the black and blue division. Let's rebuild our defense. Let's, you know, lock, lock things down and, uh, maybe Ryan Poles will be able to, you know, handle the offensive evaluations and get the right guys in there. Yeah, for me, I I'll go last to first. I had McDaniel's as as the worst one so far, and for me, it's about his track record. And I mean, we just talked about it in the in the Belichick disciples. They haven't done super well in the past, and I know he said the right things in the press conference about, you know, I did this wrong in Denver, and that's what you want to hear. And hopefully, that's the case, but. He didn't get, didn't do well with that pers personality side of things. Then he ditches the Colts job. Like it's hard for me to have a lot of confidence in that guy. And you had Tom Brady for so, so long. And since then you have Cam Newton who didn't look good, but you know, you weren't great that year. And then Mac really flames out this year. You aren't figuring out a better way to deploy him towards the end of the year. So for me, that's fourth. Third, I have Eberflus and most of it is because, I just thought you should go an offensive guy there for Justin Fields. And I know if that was the guy that you wanted and he was head and shoulders above the rest, then go for it. But he really wasn't that candidate for anyone else in the coaching cycle. Uh, he pretty much was going to get that job and then probably not a different job. So that's just a risky hire and you have to nail that offensive staff. And so I have him third. I mean, he did well with a varying personnel in with the Colts. I like that he comes from under Frank Reich, who I think is a really good head coach. He seems like he's adaptable. He was part of that McDaniel staff and then stayed on with Reich and was able to have success with a different coaching staff. So you think he can work with differing personalities 
and with different head coaches who want different things. So I think that's a plus. Uh, so I, I have him third. And then one and two, I think, could kind of go either way. I'm going to put Hackett at two. I think you like what he did with the Jags, with Blake Bortles. And then it's just really hard for me to differentiate how much is Aaron Rodgers, how much is Matt LaFleur, how much is Nathaniel Hackett. You don't get to see him out there calling plays specifically. So I wouldn't necessarily say that's a knock, but you just have that unproven um, unproven skill set for Nathaniel Hackett. He seems like he's a great personality guy. So I'll put him at two. And then Dable's number one because he was the number one guy I wanted in the coaching cycle or just to see where he ends up. I think it's an interesting fit with the Giants and sounds like they're going to stick with Daniel Jones, which who knows. Uh, but just in terms of hiring a head coach, <clears throat> excuse me, hiring a head coach, I think he's got to be someone you feel really good about because he has done lots of things. I think you see in the last two years, you see all the passing with Josh Allen, but that's not always how he had ran his offenses. He's going to fit to the personnel. And so hopefully maybe this means a Saquon renaissance for them. Hopefully this means Daniel Jones um, progressing a little bit more than he has in his short time. So I have Dable at number one. Matt, or Sam, before we get out of here, quickly, uh, Brady retired today officially. Uh, I just want to know what's going to be your lasting memory of Brady. Uh, there's so many to pick from, but... When you think Tom Brady, it pops in your head, you're going to think what? Well, let me tie it back in to the Vikings because that's of interest to our, our viewers. I think of the many disappointing aspects of the 2017 NFC Championship game debacle, not getting a chance to host a Super Bowl against Tom Brady is extremely disappointing. Mm -hmm. um, that is a legacy game. That's a once in a lifetime kind of game. And, you know, the Vikings didn't get exposed to Brady as much as other AFC teams, but they finish 0 and 6 against him in the two decades that he was in the league. And they could have had him on their turf in the Super Bowl. Um, and not getting that chance is, is just devastating i think when that opportunity is is knocking at the door a game that brady would go on to lose by the way to the to the eagles so to say that you could have beaten brady in your house i mean how sweet would that have been for vikings fans to get it done that way um but brady had a way of uh of disappointing a lot of fan bases and uh, i don't i'm not sure that anybody's walking away saying except for the giants no one's walking away saying oh we got the better of tom brady there's a very select few uh, that can say that. What a career. Yeah. For me, I'm 22. Brady was in the league 22 years. So literally since I have been alive, uh, every football season has featured Tom Brady. Uh, so for me, like growing up, I hated him at times. I loved him at times. And so it's just going to be him leaving is like a little bit of my football fandom, like where it came from is, is leaving. And I think that's the case for probably a lot of people, whether you hated him or you loved him, like you watched the games because they were in the Super Bowl all the time and they were there. So when I see that news, it was like weird because I don't know an NFL without Tom Brady and we're going to be in some uncharted territory moving forward. Yeah, seriously. And maybe Rogers announcement coming down the pipeline too. That's, that's another, another TBD. So yeah. it's, it's a, the changing landscape of the league. I think it's been, it's left in pretty good hands from a quarterback standpoint. Yeah. But, yeah, it is going to be weird. All right, Sam. Well, thank you so much for joining me on Hot Routes. Uh, I would assume we're going to have more coming down on the YouTube channel as the coach gets decided here in the next couple of days. So stay tuned for that. If they hire the coach in the next 10 minutes, don't blame us. We are just here. It is 10 a.m. on Tuesday. <laughs> um, but hopefully not all of this with this Harbaugh news is outdated. But thanks, everyone, for watching. Sam, thank you. Yep. Thanks, Paul.